Congratulations, we're so glad for you. So happy that you're here. So, last week we had our little lesson, right? Did we tell did Father Sean Levine talk to you a little bit about creation? Anybody want to tell me what you guys learned since I wasn't here? Anything? Anything? Hello? No? Nothing? Come on. So God, God out of nothing created everything, right? He said, let there be light. Notice that he was dividing the, dividing the light from the darkness. So that he's putting order. Got it? You got that? Okay, we got to order. He's taking six days. So there's a progression and a development, which we all know. Right? Okay? For example, did you know that the whole idea of the Big Bang was not believed in for a long, long time? A lot of people thought that the universe was always there. They thought the universe was eternal. And it was actually a Christian scientist who started trying to say, based on, the, on, on what he heard, and what not only heard, I mean what he was able to observe, that he brought out the idea of a Big Bang. And he was considered strange. And now it's one of the more accepted. But do we still go with that? We don't know. Because science only goes as far as we're able to see. And God says we see in part. And God fills in a lot of things that are only we only know in part. But there's a progression. And we see that finally it says, let us make man in our image, right? And that's a beautiful thing. It happens a few times in the Old Testament where all of a sudden you see God speaking in let us. And that's a privilege when you hear us because it means we're coming into the divine conversation of the us. Who's the us? Anybody? Thank you, Irene. The three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There are those who might say that it's not the three persons, that God is talking to the angels, those who want to deny a Trinity. And they go, but we're not made in the image of the angels. And the angels and God are separate and different. So how can we say, let us make man in our image, when you have a creator and then nine different orders of angels? So when he's saying us, he really is meaning us, God, who is a mystery, a mystery of a communion of three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then finally, and he says, let us make man in our image. Male and female, he created them. So mankind, you and I, are meant to be male and female. Okay? And it's, that's the beauty. And when a man and woman come together in holy matrimony, that's the closest icon of God, says St. John Chrysostom. Isn't that beautiful? The closest icon and the greatest icon of God because he created this from the beginning, before the fall in paradise, male and female. And then Presbyter Vasiliki likes to bring out that there's within us, each of us have male and female too. Okay? Now, then there's the second part, remember? There's another creation. Like all of a sudden we think we're finished, but then all of a sudden we see God like messing around with, with dust and dirt in a garden, right? There's another. And so the first part is to show us a great progression of how this universe and everything came to be. This wonderful order with six days and he rested on the seventh. But lest we feel that we're just only a tiny speck, he then brings us the creation story in a different way and he says, it's about you and I care about you. So the second creation part is he forms Adam out of what? The dust. The dust. And in that culture, the dust was the simplest, smallest particle. It's what we talk about when we say subatomic particles with leptons or whatever, right? So we know we're made out of the stardust 
and everything else that's around. We understand the art, that we, are, we have a lot of biochemistry going on. But as he makes Adam on purpose, right? He's not alive until we, like what I said, he breathed, right? And what's the breath of God? Anybody know? The Holy Spirit. The breath of God is the Holy Spirit coming into Adam and making him now alive. Every human being in this planet, whether they believe or not, is unconditionally, lovingly made alive by God's Holy Spirit. We are alive because God is sustaining us all, whether we believe or not. When we come to believe, though, we're blessed. And the grace start comes in more because we have a free will and God will always respect our free will and will never know, go against it. So he creates Adam in this beautiful and wonderful way. And he says to Adam, what? He says, take care of the garden, till it, and take care of it. And the Jewish word for taking care is not only taking care, but guard it. Guard that garden. And then what else did he tell Adam? Anybody? What else? What's going on? Huh? Not before that. Before naming. What else? Huh? Not yet. Let's not talk about the mate. So animals and mate will get there. Yes? That's right. All the animals and everything he gets to rule over them. And he says, so he does that, he says, What's in the center of the garden? There's a tree of life in the center of the garden. What else is there? The tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? Okay. And he says, you can eat of the fruit of any of these herbs or trees, anything. But the tree of good and evil, the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat. Don't eat from that. He says that. So, here we are in paradise, working the garden, tilling it, taking care of it, guarding it. So, in paradise, there is work for us. We're meant to work, to do things. And he says there's this tree of life and this tree of good and evil. And how, so, which, which one is in the center, people? Which one? Tree of life. You can only, when you think about it, think about you can only have one center, right? One center. If I have two trees, I have one of those has to be my center. Technically speaking, the tree of life is the center of the garden, my professor said. And then there was also, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Okay? Okay, and, that, and good and evil was an ancient way of saying all knowledge, all wisdom. Okay? Everything. All right. Now, what's the first not good in the Bible? Not good. Everything was good and very good. What's the first not good? It was not, yes, yes? Adam being alone and lonely, right? It's not good for Adam to be alone. That's the first not good. Think about it. It's in the Bible. It's not good. We are meant to be in community. There is no such thing as a baby born by itself. There's no test tube baby born from a test tube. Everybody is born from a mother. We're all born into a family. We're meant to be in community. So it's not good that Adam is alone. So what did God do? What did he do? Huh? Everybody says he created Eve, made him, gave him a wife. Not yet. He first, before he did that, if you read the God, if you read the scriptures, 
He gave him all the animals. It's not good that you're alone, Adam. Here are all these animals for you. Why? And he said, and he waited, name them. Now this is how I want you to read scripture. Get the facts, but think about it. How does it relate to my life? In that culture, naming something meant two things. This is how I define you. This name means you. So I'm defining you. And this is how I relate to you. So now do you get why God is above all names? Do you get how when Jacob is wrestling with the angel of God and Jacob says, what's your name? The angel goes, why are you asking my name? You can't really know my full name. But I'll name you, Jacob, Israel. So God defines us and God gives us identity. But in that culture, naming something was to define it to know it fully and how to relate to it. So God is saying, name these animals. You and I in our culture now, we go to school. We name things, we understand things, we become overseers of things, and we are stewards of things. We develop our careers. And so in a sense, Adam is given a career we have our career and our calling. But that was not enough. Still, Adam was alone. And to show you that you and I are not meant to be identified only by our career. One of the most popular questions, depending on where you live, but it's, what do you do? Right? You go to a party, you meet somebody, what do you do? As if what you do defines you. But we're more than just what we do. And love takes us a whole other direct, a whole greater place. So then that's why the next thing in Genesis, he then puts Adam to sleep. And in the Greek, there's the word ecstasy there. And ecstasy means something that's... So think about it. It's not good that Adam is alone. Adam is given every animal in the garden. Adam has his career. Adam has his calling. But from within Adam, there comes this ecstasy for more. Unless you and I know how to have love that pours out, how can we have a spouse? Unless you teach your children to have love that pours out, How can they have friends? Unless we really allow God's breath and spirit to spill over. So he's in a sleep. In other words, you know, if you want to be romantic, his dream girl, you know, he's dreaming of his girl. (laughs) It's a little romantic. It's schmaltzy, right? It's like, okay, follow us. But he's asleep. God takes from the rib. Why didn't he make Eve like he made Adam out of the dust? Why? The Jews asked this question before even Christ came along. Why? In my hand, I have, what is this? This is an iPhone. Does anybody know which version it is? (laughs) How many of you are looking forward to the 10, right? It's supposed to be better than all of them. We have a tendency as human beings to say, I want the latest version. If he created Eve out of the dust of the earth, it could easily be that we say, Eve is better than Adam. She came second, the better model. It could also mean that she's separate. But in order for us to understand the unity and communion we're supposed to have as persons in God, he took from the rib his very own body and blood and he creates Eve and breathes into Eve so that when Adam finally wakes up, he can say, finally, flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. 
she shall be called woman, for she came out of her man. And that's why a man shall love his wife like he loves himself, says St. Paul, right, in Ephesians. No man ever hates his body or his flesh, so he should love his wife. Isn't that beautiful? It's really beautiful and so deep. It's a simple story, yet so profoundly deep, right? The Jews even asked this question, why the rib and not the head or the foot or some other part of the body? He says the ribs are the best. (laughs) (laughs) My daughter would agree with you. (laughs) She fell in love with barbecue ribs out here in Texas, let me tell you. The ribs are the best. (laughs) So the woman is tasty, is what you're saying. All right. (laughs) Sorry. So, not the head, so that we think Eve is smarter than Adam. Not the foot, so that Adam steps over Eve. But the rib closest to the heart so that she's always in his heart and he's in hers and that they're next to each other as helpmates. And then notice the new Adam. Who's the new Adam? Jesus Christ. And when he's laid out on the cross, the very last thing that happens after he gives his final breath, right? He says, it is finished. And he breathes his last. A soldier takes his spear and spears him through the ribs into the heart and outpours blood and water for the church. And he has been nurturing and nourishing his bride, the church, with the water of baptism and cleansing of sin and his body and blood communion ever since and that we are in his heart. And it was through the ribs. You can't make this stuff up. I mean, you can't make this up. That from Genesis you hear this, and then you see how Jesus Christ fulfills it. It's beautiful. So now we're in this beautiful garden. And he says, you're free. Just don't eat from that tree. Which means, in, and I was like, what, you know, why? You know, you know, we always then go to the thing that we can't have. That's what the kids are. We can't have, why can't I have that? Don't, don't. In paradise, we have limits. Even in paradise, there are limits. So then, guess, look at this. And Adam is supposed to guard it. Right? He's supposed to guard it. What happens? Sorry, it's shakes. All of a sudden, there's this nice little slippery, you know, a snake has two forked tongue, doesn't tell you the truth. He moves around like this. You don't even know where he's going. Right? Snake goes and invades paradise, goes into the garden. Men, you and I especially, we try to guard our homes, right? To make it our garden. Women, to protect our children. Right? We don't want any snake to come in. But it does. No matter how much we try, something will come in. Something will come in. And notice, he goes right to Eve. And this is what the Father says what happens with us with sin. The first thing, he starts, he goes with Eve and he starts saying, Psemata, something false, because he doesn't know God anyway. He just starts a conversation. Every sin will start with some conversation or dialogue in our head, which gets very messed up sometimes, or me, or somebody from the outside. We are good. God created us good. But see, something comes from the outside, right? And that's the first thing. And what did the devil say? What did the serpent say to Eve? Come on, you guys have it in front of you. What did he say? that this doesn't take forever, Russell. Come on. What did it say? Come on, Russell. No. What did he say about it? He says, what? Come on. Read it. Huh? He said, why doesn't he want you to eat from there? He said, that's the best stuff you can No, not exactly. But yeah, it's kind of what it's going to make. What does it say? Come on. Somebody look at it and find it. What does it say? What do the serpents say? 
Is it true that God told you that you shall not eat from every tree of the garden? Is that? Ah, that's not true. What are you talking about? That's how a lot of times things don't. What do you That's outrageous. No. And the, the, the devil likes to make us get outrageous, right? No, that's not true. We keep, that's not what God said. That's not what God said. So the devil is spouting out a lie and maybe something that could even be outrageous and something that could get us emotional outside, you know. And he says, is it true that you can't eat of any of the tree? And what does Eve say back? You, we may eat of the fruit of the garden except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil which is in the middle of the garden. Notice what she says. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil which is in the middle of the garden. Do you guys get that? Do you see that? What did we just say was the middle of the garden? Tree of life. What does the tree of life symbolize for us? We know. It's Jesus Christ on the cross. It's God's everlasting love that gives us immortality. God is the center of our garden and our life. But now when the serpent comes, she says, we may eat it, but any tree except for the one in the middle, all of a sudden her middle is not God. It's going to what she can't have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the one I can't have, or the one that's desirable. Notice, how many of us do that? How many of us put something else in the middle of our lives, in our thoughts, in our hearts, like the thing that I wish I could just have a house like those, those Joneses down there. If I only had that, that, that job that Sheila had, or whatever, you know, we all do that. Something shifts us. She says, no. And notice Eve, who didn't hear the commandment straight from God. Adam did. Adam told Eve. So we don't know where this communication goes, but Eve then exaggerates it. God said, don't eat of the fruit. She says, we cannot eat of the fruit or even touch how many of us like to exaggerate commandments? Right? Exaggerate God's commandments. Maybe even make them harsher. You can't even touch this tree. You can't touch it. Now, God didn't say that. He said, don't have the fruit of it. But he said, get, touch it, or you will surely die. You will die by death. So all of a sudden, her shift goes to what she can't have. She's talking with the devil. The She's exaggerating God's commandment. And then the devil says, that's not true. For God knows, for you will be, what does it say? Read it. For God knows in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Sounds pretty good. What should we do when that happens? What do you think is happening to her? Huh? What's happening? What would happen to you if you were in that conversation and you heard that? And you're Eve. Huh? You're tempted. But what do you think? What, what do you think? You'd have doubt. Good. Doubt of what? You've had doubt the Word of God. You, you're right. You're absolutely right. Bravo, Stathis. You're right. You would doubt. Because now he's saying, and why are you doubting? Why are you doubting? Huh? Yeah, but why is she, why do you think, it's, what is she doubting? It's true. Our faith is what helps take care of our doubts or ward off she, all of a sudden, he's making her think that God is trying to keep her down, maybe. 
God doesn't want her to be like him. God is trying to lord it over her. Is that true? Is that the God we know that gives his final breath on the cross? That nourishes us from his heart? That gave a garden in the first place? That wants to give us everlasting life? No. But the devil put that she began to doubt not only the word of God, but say, is he keeping me away from something good? And you know, I mean, there are songs out there about, you know, our teenagers, you know, that they're missing out if they live the Christian life, you know. Right? We have to be careful. So anyway, she's got doubt. Now, what, what would you and I do if we've got doubt? You would question, what else should we do? What would you and I do in ch- now knowing? Pray, pray. And do what? Go back to the source. We would pray and go back to the source. Say, God, let me tell you, these people are, this serpent is telling me something. Is it true? Tell me. I want you to tell me. I'm trying to trust in you. But notice this is our story, and a lot of times when we doubt, we don't go back to the source. And we won't go back to God because we become afraid of losing that love. How many of us go to our spouses with some of our doubts? How many times do kids don't come to their parents because they're afraid that they might not still love them or cherish them? That's what the devil does, right? So it starts with a conversation. It starts with doubt. And then Eve looks at the tree. She doesn't go back to God. She looks at the tree. She looks at the fruit that it's good to eat. And she takes it. And you and I look at a lot of things in this world that seem really good. And we don't ask God for permission. You know, monks, all the time monks, no, you can't live as a monk without going to your abbot and says, with your blessing, can I do this? Can I have your blessing for this? Is it okay for me to do this with an open conscience, free conscience? Obedience, especially with the monks, gives them free conscience. They are free. The abbot said, yes, they have no reservations, no doubts, and they go forward. That's a good life. Many of us in life, we go, we keep, is this, Right? We go like this. Is this a good decision? Is this a bad decision? A good business move? A bad? I don't, I don't, we go like this, right? All the time. And that's why we try to pray. She doubts, she takes the fruit. And the thing is, she takes it without Jesus, without God. And that's the sin. That she not only disobeyed, but she didn't realize she's she's starting to live apart from God and trying to get something to satisfy her apart from God. And then she gives it to Adam. When we live apart from God, that's the break. And that's the whole thing. And when we look outside to fill the inside, because the breath of life came inside and the kingdom of heaven is inside. Make sense? Okay. Maybe this is too long, huh? Do you guys like it? It's learning? Yes? Okay. All right. We're going to continue. Okay, we'll continue. We'll go into next week. You can see it's going to be about the flood. Okay? So they fall. I'll tell you that really quickly. So she falls. Let me. We'll continue next week, okay? It's been a long day. God bless you all. The kids are all learning this.
So when you take, get them in the car or when you meet anybody else, you can talk about this, okay? God bless you and God keep you and make his face shine upon you.